Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks so much, Fan, for bringing me. It's always great to be reunited with my good friend, ta and we decided to dress alike tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I told her we got different shoes. Yeah, though, so. switch it up a little bit. I couldn't rock the silver. <laughs> before I go that far. Um, so, <clears throat> what I, you know, when I, I got the book this summer and really didn't even know what the book was going to be about, um, and when I opened it, I was like, oh, this is like a, this is like a mixtape. <laughs> uh, the best of, but then a remix with the pre-essays. Um, so that really, in your love of hip hop, like, were you thinking, did you think mixtape at all? I didn't, but um, I think, as I write in one of those essays, I can't remember which one, which one it is, but um, I'm so glad the mic works. Um, <laughs> whoever the sound guy was, I was giving in trouble. Thank you, whoever you are. <laughs> he told me he knew He's what he was doing. There. Yeah, he knew what he was doing. He's right. We've had so much. We've had trouble, issues, no issues tonight. Yeah, still time to mess this up. <laughs> uh, no, I um, I think though, like, I have a buddy, and she says everybody has an art that's kind of like their first language. Um, and for me, that's hip hop. So um, I, I would not reject that illusion. It has a huge influence over how I write um, and, and how I think about you know uh, art and, and writing in general. So I, I certainly would not reject that. We were eight <coughs> years in power. Um, talk about the origin of that quote and linking it to good Negro government. Yeah. So um, in 1895, uh, there was a congressman a former congressman by the name of Thomas Miller. Uh, Thomas Miller was a congressman out of, out of South Carolina at the end of the Civil War during the period of, of Reconstruction, um, a, a remarkable period in, in American history where, I'm sorry, it's gonna be a little long, forgive yep, me. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry, stick with me. Uh, I give this answer to people just, you know, <laughs> Reconstruction. <laughs> it's like, come on, man, I worked on this. <laughs> Uh, so Mil Miller was a, a congressman, a Reconstruction era congressman, and uh, you know he was one of a, uh, one of um, the contributors to arguably the most genuine moment of, of multiracial uh, democracy in, in this country. A brief period of eight years following the Civil War, where you had you know African Americans who had <coughs> been enslaved, African Americans who had been free, suddenly have access not just to the vote, but to the halls of, of power. You had you know, black governors, you know, for the first time, you had black senators and you had black congressmen, one of which was Thomas Miller. And in 1895, after the country had retreated from the promise of, of reconstruction and basically had you know, re reunited itself uh, on, on the principle of white supremacy, uh, the South Carolina legislature went about the business of <clears throat> really uh, finishing off the process of disenfranchising black people in South Carolina. Now, now you have to understand what, what that means. In 1895, the majority of people living in South Carolina were black. Um, so it, it, we're not even talking about minority rights, we're talking about apartheid effectively. Um, and that was what, you know, that, that was not just true in uh, South Carolina, it was also true to say in a state like Mississippi, for instance. Um, I think a lot of times when we think about people being deprived of what you think about a small minority population, but really, actually, what, what, what you're talking about is uh, the total uh, destruction of democracy in, in any sort of form in those states. And Miller could not understand why uh, white South Carolinians would, would want to do this. And he took the floor to address the Constitutional um, <coughs> Assembly. And he said, you know, we, we were eight years in power. And he didn't mean just black people. He meant you know, this multiracial experiment that included black people, but it wasn't just black people. <clears throat> and he said in that, in that period of time, we, we reconstructed the state of South Carolina. There was no real public school system before those black folks uh, off of the plantation and those two free black folks joined in government with you know, a sympathetic white folks that were willing to, to, to work with them. Uh, they established an entire architecture you know, of the state. They established what would have been called a saint and solemns at that time. They established what we, you know, today would call prisons. They, as he said, reconstructed the entire state. And he said, after having done all of that, after giving all this to the state, why would you strip us of rights? He was dumbfounded. And Du Bois, W.E.B. Du Bois reporting on this, you know, many, many years later, about 50 years later in his great book, Black Reconstruction, 
he maintains that Miller didn't quite understand. He didn't apprehend the, the true monstrosity of white supremacy. And he had this line, I was reading you know, uh, Black Reconstruction as I was working on this book, and he says what, what Miller failed to understand was the only thing white supremacists in South Carolina feared more than bad Negro government was good Negro government. The idea was it was the very fact that they had succeeded that was the insult. And so he's making this appeal, we did well, but he doesn't get, that's the whole point. They know you did well. <clears throat> but the fact that you did well insults white supremacy. It makes it you know, harder to, you know, it makes white supremacy much less tenable. And so the whole idea of disenfranchisement you know, was, you know, and, and it's not to say that folks would come out and admit this, but in their heart of hearts, it's about not having to compete with certain people. You know, and so they'll say, well, you can't run with me, but really, if I don't let you compete with me, then you know, that, that, that question is taken off the table to begin with. <clears throat> I think that was an incredible truth that you can see reverberating throughout uh, African American history and throughout American history, actually. Um, I think it you know, tells us a lot about the, the past eight years in, in this country. I think uh, there was you know, a large number, not most, but a large number, a disturbingly large number of people in this country who um, feared good Negro government. Um, I mean that not just in terms of policies passed and the, you know, the ability to actually you know, make government work, although with the current government in power, we're now seeing how important that actually is. <laughs> um, but it's also about comportment. You know, I, I, I always tell people, like uh, Barack and Michelle were like um, a walking advertisement, <laughs> and, and, uh, an ambassador, as you will, uh, for the integration of black people into the most bourgeois middle class American norms. Here you have an Ivy League uh, uh, educated professor, first black head of the, uh, the, of the uh, Harvard Law Review, married to this black woman you know, from the South Side, you know, uh, who's also Ivy League educated, two beautiful kids, dog named Bo. <laughs> I mean, this is the best we got. <laughs> it's not, you know, you can't accept this. I mean, you know, it, I don't know how you're going to deal with me, because if you can't take that, you know, me and you, ain't, it, ain't, it ain't going to work. And the fact of the matter is, you know, I, I think that very ordinariness, that, you know, very, you know, um, success at appealing to those values was actually the insult. That was what, you know, that, that was the thing that, 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 you know, was seen as dangerous. And I think there's a strain of that, you know, all, all the way through American history. I won't bore you with other examples, but that, that, that was the, uh, the, the origin of the title. And most people don't know that you were a history major at I Howard. was a history major at Howard, <laughs> yes. Yes, I did not graduate with a history diploma. Um, I did not graduate at all, but I was a history major. I find myself thinking was that we were eight years in power. Was that a double entendre? Like, mm -hmm. We, re we understand you're talking about Reconstruction, but then is it Obama? Is it mm -hmm. black people? Mm -hmm. Is it black writers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who, I mean, I certainly think I have some success right. <laughs> because of the right. Obama age, just as you repeatedly point out for yourself. Right, right. No, I, th I think that's true. I think there were a whole crop of black writers who um, were empowered by the fact of Obama. I, I did not think black people. I know a lot of people read the title that way, but I didn't read it that way because that's not what Thomas Miller was saying. You know, he wasn't saying we as black people were, you know, because that, that wasn't true. He was speaking to the actual government. And I, I, you know, I felt the same way about Obama and, you know, like it being very, you know, narrow, narrow cast. I would never say black people were in power, which implies like a kind of control over the, yeah. over the country. You know, it didn't really exist. Do you think the symbolism of Obama is more important than the policies hmm. of Obama? No, but I think symbolism is underrated. Um, I think one of the ways that people criticize uh, Barack Obama, and I, you know, I have my you know, shared critiques myself, but I think one of the things they say is, well, and I don't even think this is true, but you know, one of the things that you hear is, well, it was no substance, it was just, Symbolism, and I tell them symbolism is not just symbolism. Um, if it meant something that you had an unbroken string of white male presidents, and then that 
ended, and we all maintain that it did. There was nobody before Barack Obama who would say that it meant nothing that a, you know, a black person was never president. Nobody who would say that. There's nobody who would say now that it means nothing that there's never been a woman president. Of course it means something. It means a lot. You know? um, so then you have to accept that when that string is broken, that must mean something too. You know? And I think the hard thing is the very, um, I think the problem is it doesn't mean as much as people want it to mean. <laughs> but it means something. You know, it definitely means something. You know, it you know means that um, you know to me, you know, among other things, among other things, it means to me that if you are uh, African American and you're really, 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 really smart, and you work really, really, really hard, and you get really, really lucky, like really, like the country's falling apart, <laughs> <laughs> and there's no one else to turn to, <laughs> and they're like, we tried that already. <laughs> You might be president. <laughs> you, might, you might be, I mean, and that wasn't true 30 years ago. You understand? Like, I don't think, like, I, you know, I was, I was doing this event, actually, um, for President Frederick at his house, and Kurt Schmoke was there. Kurt Schmoke was the first elected black mayor of Baltimore. <clears throat> and there were a whole crop of politicians before Barack Obama who could have been Barack Obama, but it was not their time. It just wasn't their time. So you, you, you have to say something has changed. Something is clearly different, you know? Um, it's not everything. It's not the wealth gap, you know, but it, but, it, but it is something. I remember during the 2008 election, This American Life was out, I think it was Pennsylvania, and they knocked on this white family's door, mm -hmm. and he said, who are you voting for? And mm -hmm. she asked her husband, she said, we voting for the nigger. Mm -hmm. Probably <laughs> nigger, not nigger. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it was like, yeah, the economy, it was just such a dis right. disarray, we're, we're gonna, right. this, this is who we're gonna vote for. Right. Um, one of the pieces that I did not read when it originally came out was about why black people don't visit Civil War yeah, sites. Right, right. And I have found myself recently thinking about maybe my own, not uncomfortability with slavery. You know, Colson Whitehead's book is great. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, I read Jubilee as a child. Uh -huh. um, we watched The Roots every Sunday and dressed up and ate fried chicken in my oh, house with Lord. other families. Oh, like, Lord. clearly, not, white, no white people. Right, um, <laughs> but there is there is a lot of slavery in popular culture, and there has been a part of me that has thought, is it just showing black people as victims? Like, yeah. why is the slavery image the image that we mm -hmm. see a lot? Um, but I think what I realize that it's we we don't talk about slavery in economics, right. economic terms. Right. It becomes right. as the, um, you know, the noble slave, like all slaves are good, which is right. why Colson's book was so good, because it showed like humanity in slavery, right. Right. which right. I can't ever really recall. I heard Underground was good. I've never saw it right. on, on WGN. But I've challenged myself like, okay, we can show these images, but I don't think we link it enough to capitalism right. and no, the founding true. of this, the, this country, sure. but talk about your sort of journey of, you know, not just the reconstruction, but looking at, at slavery and yeah. why you were visiting those sites. You know what it is now? I, I think for whatever reason, um, there is a um, liberal mode of analyzing the problem of, of racism in this country, and, and, and the, that's not even the vocabulary people would use. They would use the problem of race and there's a lot of, which I don't, I don't use that. Um, th th there's a lot of talk about like the heart. Like it's always like this kind of moral appeal, you know, uh, good people, racism is a cancer in, in, in the, in the uh, you know, American heart. You know, it's a very, um, I don't know, sentimentalist kind of take. And what people don't understand is like, um, Enslavement was big business. Like they, they don't understand it that way, and I didn't understand it that way. And you know, the book is a large part, you know, about my discovery of this. Um, and for instance, and I've said this, so if you ever heard me speak, forgive me for repeating it. But it's a very, very imp important set of facts to understand. <coughs> you have um, four million, roughly uh, uh, four million enslaved uh, black people in, in the country at the start of the Civil War. Um, at the time, those slaves put together. Uh, were worth approximately uh, $3 billion, okay? About $75 billion in, in, in today's dollars. Um, $3 billion in 1860 was more than all the banks 
all the factories, nascent factories, all the shipyards, um, all the everything, all the productive capacity this country put together was worth less than the four million bodies that were enslaved in the South. Um, if you wanted to find where the largest concentration of, of millionaires was in this country, it wasn't in Chicago, it wasn't in New York, it wasn't in Boston, it was in the Mississippi River Valley. 60% um, of our exports in 1860 were cotton. Um, it, it, it was huge, like it was, jack like, you, like when, I, when people, you know, it becomes sort of cliche, but people say, well, you couldn't have America without slavery, and it sounds we're talking, no, it's literally true. It's, I mean, you try to extract that wealth out of the country, and you don't, you just don't have the same country. You know, you, you, you really don't. As I said, you know, in, in the beginning, the majority of people living in South Carolina were enslaved. Majority of people living in Mississippi were enslaved. Half the people living in Louisiana, half the people living in Georgia, nearly half the people living in Alabama. I mean, this was a huge, huge deal. And if you go and visit, if you've ever visited the, the Civil War battle parks, battlefields in this country, they're getting better about this. But they will struggle to explain to you why some seven, eight hundred thousand people died. Um, states' rights don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> right to do what exactly? <laughs> you know, oh, it was different, different life. So eight hundred thousand people. That's what happened. Like you had a disagreement. I mean, these are sort of explanations that have been historically eight hundred thousand people died. Like usually when you have, I mean, this is twenty percent of the white male military age population in the South was exterminated in the Civil War. That like demands some sort of powerful interest at work. And the answer to that is the, you know, the, 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 uh, the economic institution of slavery and how that economic institution you know, basically became a, uh, a, a social institution. I, I try to explain this to people, you know, um, and, and, and forgive me, I don't wanna like make light <clears throat> you know, so, but it's, it's the best way that, that I can understand it. You, you know like how like home ownership is not just, you know, Americans have huge amounts of wealth in their homes. But if you tried to explain home ownership to, to an alien, you wouldn't just talk about the wealth, right? You would talk about the institution. You would talk about how they have magazines, you know, dedicated to home ownership and fixing up your home. How homeowners get together and talk about what they want to do, you know, to their homes and, you know, putting on a new extension and all the good things that homeowners talk about. You talk about all the businesses that, that, that come out of the fact of having home ownership. You talk about our tax code. You have this big, huge conversation about all the things that come out of something that seems so small. Well, enslavement was the same thing. There were whole institutions you know, and laws and you know, social ideas. To be you know, a rich person in the South was to own black people, period. It was no other thing. That was what you did. Much like when you have money, you go and buy a home. Like that's a thing you do in America. In the South, you went and bought people. Everybody, you know, did it. And so it, it was a system in which folks were totally, totally meshed. That has nothing to do with how pure your heart is. It has nothing to do with you know any sort of cancer in your. There's no real way, you know, a, a, a moral argument. I'm not saying there's no moral component to owning people. Obviously, there is. But I just think, um, you know, that that's a way of. Um, us establishing a kind of distance from something that we find abominable as opposed to confronting the much more disturbing truth that we would have owned people to. You know, that it says, you know, something about like the, the, the power of institutions and systems. It's probably no surprise that my favorite piece of yours would be the case of reparations. Um, to Chicago? No, not, not just, no. I was <laughs> glad you're on the west side, not on my turf, the south side. Um, <laughs> I think that you and I and others were starting to read some of the same literature at the same mm -hmm. time. Like mm -hmm. we have the exact same mm -hmm. sources mm -hmm. in our work, scholars who've looked at home ownership and mm -hmm. you know, my journey realizing that this is the crux, just, just your, your explanation of home ownership, right. but how home ownership, we, we decided, well, Woodrow Wilson decided, I learned this in Richard Rothstein's book. I've always mm -hmm. wondered, like, when did home ownership become this thing, like, mm -hmm. before FDR? Right. Well, Wilson thought that home ownership would prevent people, if, if people owned property, they wouldn't revolt like they were right. in Russia. Right, it was anti-communist, yeah. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so all the, and we, we've, America has said, this is the system for wealth building, but we're going to systematically say black people are not going right. to be 
a part of this system. Right. right. Um, and I don't think we talk about that enough. Yeah. And you also talk in your in your journey with this, going from the, you know, individual work really hard mm -hmm. and have some luck to mm -hmm. these structural forces, which makes this about race, not class. And of yeah. course, they're entwined. But you could be a wealthy black person and still have these same deleterious effects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's almost uh, race as class. Um, because what effectively has happened is black people, you know, uh, comprise a totally different economic class. You know, it's outside of, you know, sort of mainstream. If you're talking about, there is no comparison between the, like black middle class people and white, like none. None. I mean, and none at all. I, I'll give you an example. If you look at the gap um, between uh, unemployment and it, it persists at every level. <laughs> between black and white. It's the same, it persists for college, for high school dropouts, high school graduates, college graduates, college dropouts, Ivy League, whatever, at every level, you know what I mean? It, it, it's persistent. You know, wealth gap, you know, is the same. It is, you know, I, I, I think about like, like myself and how, how I grew up, right? I had two parents, you know what I mean, who worked. I lived in a neighborhood though that like, um, you would not think somebody with two parents who worked would. And I, I didn't understand why at the time, you know? Um, but it's relatively normal for quote unquote black middle class or black work to live on a, a totally different level and to live in, 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 a, in a different kind of way. I think the reason why we don't talk about it though is because it just, it explains too much. You know, it becomes immediately clear you know, why things are the way they are. It's an easy answer. I mean, you look at, like, like with the homicide, you know, uh, rate and all these people talking about black on black crime, it's not hard to understand. You know, it is for some people. I mean, it really, it truly is. If you systematically wall off a group of people, if you deprive them of resources, by law, by the way, by, by law, through the efforts of the public sector and the private sector, um, if those people have a history before even that of being deprived of wealth, of being, you know, being plundered, as I argue, in the case for reparations, and you have extremely lax gun laws in your country, well, they'll tend to be some, some effects. You know, some things will, you know, come out of that. And so I think one of the problems, problems is we discuss this as a black issue, but, it, but it's not. I mean, it's not. In other words, by which I mean it has nothing to do with the color of my skin. You know, um, you say black on black as, as though I, I am doing something that no other group of people would do if you put them in the very same condition. You know, um, people tend to kill the people they're around. <clears throat> I mean, this, this is the regrettable truth. Most white people are killed by other white people. I mean, that, that's just true. <laughs> So, I mean, it's not like when black people, you know, kill, they're going to, you know, get in a car and drive, you know, out to, that's not how, <laughs> you know, crime and violent crime tends to happen. That's not true of any human community anywhere. And so why it would be different for black people, why you would be surprised that it's more of it for black people, given the specific conditions and specific history, um, I, I don't know. The, the problem is once you see that and once it's clear the state did this, and you know, we can, you know, without a doubt prove that the state did it. The obvious question becomes, okay, well, what are you gonna do about it? You know, because you did do this. You clearly, I mean, it's not even debatable. You did it. You I mean, know? In, in addition to retiring, like, let's say white on white crime instead of black on black crime, right. I think we should start saying white segregation right. as well. I mean, seriously, seriously. So we're in this moment where I think maybe we're too close, but I think history is gonna really judge us hard. Yeah. I think our grandchildren are gonna be like, what the hell yeah, yeah, was yeah, going yeah. on? Yeah, no, it's bad, it's bad. It's um, incredibly irresponsible. Incredibly irresponsible, it's bad. It's bad, no, I, I think you're, um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I mean, no, what, is your, what is your prediction? Like, what, 50 years from, I mean, how, it, are we going to have distance in 10 years? Is it going to be 25? Is it going to be after we're gone? Like what? You know, when this happens, and it has happened at other points in, a, in American history, like there were people who knew and said it at the time that the Trail of Tears was bad. Like people knew this was a horrible moral. People often make this excuse for people. They say, well, you know, such and such was a man of their time. Bullshit. Bullshit. They say such and such was Was what? a man of their time. <laughs> it's bullshit. And every time there are people who know this is wrong. You, you understand what I'm saying? It's, 
And I, it's always the case. And so it is not the case that, you know, say like, you know, we're going through this effort right now, people are taken down. So it's not the case that Robert E. Lee was a man of his time. It's just not true. This is not true. The black people he owned knew he was wrong. <laughs> they were of their time too. You know, and other people knew he was wrong. John Brown was also of his time. You know what I mean? It, it is never the case that they're, you know, to just, you know what I mean, that, that no one knows. And we're in this moment right now. I mean, it, it I, I don't know. Um, I, you know, I get this question. They say, well, Tana, are you saying that everybody who voted for Trump <laughs> was a racist or a white supremacist or a bit? No. Well, somebody clearly thinks that. <laughs> <laughs> I they don't. were okay with it, though? Right, no, that's, <laughs> that the, that's the thing, right? No, no, I, I, no, I don't. I don't, I don't. Um, any more than I think every person in uh, Nazi Germany was a rabid anti-Semite. But that, that, that is, you know, um, a, a very low bar. <laughs> An extremely low bar. <laughs> because the fact of the matter is, you know, and we obviously have less excuse, you know, um, the, the obvious, you know, fact to me is, that the majority of people, not the majority of people, everyone who voted with Trump had no problem with a white supremacist or a racist being president. So you might personally in your heart say you're okay with it, but you were cool giving this dude the nukes. See, that, that, you thought that was okay. You know, you thought, you know, a dude who bragged about sexual harassment should be, you know, the most Sexual assault, sexual not assault, harassment. Excuse me, yeah, thank yeah. you, thank you. You know, a dude that bagged about sexual assault, like, should be the most powerful person in the world, arguably. You thought that was okay. You know, that to me is enough. That's, that's damning enough. I mean, you don't need to, you know, personally, you know, be, you know, X, Y, and Z. The fact that you, and I think people are going to be like, y'all lost your minds. And, and, y'all lost your damn and, minds. Now, you're, like, there's a ecology of how journalism works, and you have a lot more freedom than some other reporters. Right. But there are like some really insane debates going on in newsrooms where, like why are we debating whether to call him a white supremacist? I don't get it. I, I don't get it. I, I don't, um, I, I don't get it. <laughs> I don't get it. I mean, the dude said that the judge couldn't, uh, <laughs> couldn't look at his case because he's a Mexican. That's what he said. That, that's what he said, you know what I mean? I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't understand how this is like vague at, at, at all, except that it's too horrible to accept it. I, I still just, think that, too horrible to accept. that some white people think that you have to own a hood in your closet, like that's right. the bar for racism. Right, but that's, that's escapism. Yeah. That, 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 that's escapism, you know? Um, I don't have to burn the flag for people to call me anti-American, that's not the bar for me. You know, um, so I think people put that bar intentionally high in order to excuse a, a lot of behavior. Um, the race and gender analysis sometimes I feel is off. Like people who, no matter how, how you mm -hmm. feel about the candidates, like there's no sexism in mm -hmm. Clinton's loss mm -hmm. and there's no racism in Trump's right. win. Right. Um, how do you factor gender um, in this last cycle? Uh, I think it was huge. I think it was absolutely huge. Again, I think um, even if you take um, the fact of Hillary Clinton off the table, which you should not, um, again, somebody bragged about sexual assault and was elected president. That should be a disqualifier. Like, the very fact that's not a disqualifier. Like, that's a statement. Um, that's a huge, and that, and that this was, by the way, consistent with other behavior. Like, so let's not make this sound like it was a one-off. You know, like this dude don't have other people accused him. He does, he does. Um, so I think that was a huge statement. I think, um, what was it, the second debate? You know, where as far as I'm concerned, he sexually he was, harassed him. he was Clinton. lurking yeah. on stage, you know what I mean? I, I could not act that way, and nor should I be able to towards a woman in my workplace, you know, towards another human being, period. Um, somehow that was okay, you know? Um, that is to say nothing other crowds where, you know, somebody yells, you know, Trump that bitch, Trump that bitch? Like, that's what we're doing now? You know? Um, so, no, it, it, was, it was a huge fact. It was huge. I don't think, um, I think the standard, and I have my own, you know, thoughts and, and, and criticisms of, of, of Hillary Clinton, but I think the standard for her <laughs> obviously was not the standard for Donald Trump. <laughs> Somebody was clearly being held to a higher standard. You, you know what I mean? And I think, um, 
I don't know. I mean, that, that is the essence of it. That, 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 that's the essence of, you know, any sort of, you know, racism, sexism, what have you. It is that I am forgiving over here and significantly less forgiving over there. You know, that I expect, you know, a kind of morality out of, you know, one person and then I excuse it, you know, when I see it coming from somebody else. Uh, you know, this notion, I'm sorry, I mean, I go forever on this, but like this notion that like Hillary's a liar. What, what is Trump though? <laughs> <laughs> what, what? And Trump's not? Like, really? No, I mean, no. So it was clear. It was clear and obvious. I hate to be cliche and be like, oh, haters are going to hate. I don't know how you're processing this, but it seems like just in these past couple of weeks that the book has been out that there's been a different kind of criticism yeah. levied at you. And yeah. how are you processing that? Do you just, like, stay off of Twitter? <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, and, I mean, and you, I mean, you're very clear about, I didn't seek the crown, I don't wear the crown, yeah. I, you, you promote other black writers, right. um, but it's like, oh, he doesn't talk about Native Americans, he doesn't talk about this, he doesn't <laughs> talk about that. Um, <laughs> how are you, I mean, do, do you feel a difference this time? I actually don't, because I think it was a lot for Between the World and Me. And I think actually the amount, it might be more now. You're right, it, might, it could be more. I think it was a lot for first white president. When we, that, that obviously was a lot. Um, but between the world and me prepared me, and so I, I'm significantly less surprised. You know, I have my moments, I get pissed off. But um, um, you, you can't fight me. You understand what I'm saying? Like, you're not going to go do the reporting I'm going to do. You're not going to go do the research I'm going to do. You know, um, you're not going to spend the amount of time. What about know? from academics who have a different standard? I mean, they're not journalists. You're not get, an academic. I get a lot less of that. I get okay. a lot. Mostly what I get is quick one-offs. Um, but I, you know, like I, I, what I mean by that is, like, there's something about when you actually go do the reporting, when you actually go do the research, you feel so much better armed than somebody that's just given a reaction. They don't, like, have the guns, really. You know, um, we're in this moment right now, um, I think, where, you know, there are a number of African-American journalists, you know, like yourself, um, like Jelani at the New Yorker, like Nicole Hannah-Jones, and these are people who um, are not just, like, black writers, like, sort of saying black things, but, like, they know, they have access to a kind of knowledge that let's just say other people do not have and aren't really interested in. Um, I actually think that shines through. <laughs> I think that's clear. I think people understand on some level, even if they can't articulate it, the difference between I read this and I did not like it, so I took a day and wrote 800 words, and somebody that sat with a problem you know, and, and let it steep. So I, I don't think, um, I, I don't know, man. I'm on to the next piece. You know, I mean, I'm on to the next thing for people to complain about. So I just, um, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I think, um, I think having, like, I, I'm, I'm struggling to get this across. Um, you just are so much better prepared for the world. Like, that stuff, people give reactions and it's ephemeral. Mm -hmm. You know, the critiques of between the world, people read between the world to me and the critiques of it, I think mostly have, you know, they're still there, but. You know, um, people still reading the book. <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, so if I do my job right, that's what should happen. You know what I mean? And people can critique, and that's fine. That, that's okay. That's, that's yeah. okay. You know, um, but what I'm trying to do is create the thing that's going to sit there. You know, um, like I think about Baldwin, right? Nobody remembers what Eldridge Cleaver said about Baldwin. No one. Only I know that because I had to, you know, go in and, I mean, you obviously have some, some idea too, but only if you're like really trying to figure it out. Nobody remembers, like nobody cites that. Nobody says, yes, that was really, you know what I mean? And I'm not saying I'm, I'm at that level. I'm saying that, you know, but the process of trying to get to that level, I think is much more substantial. I'm sort of sitting back and, you know, taking your shots. <laughs>